know that she was done <laughs> and I quit but it was just a delight you know? <coughs> sounds of life you know, I never lose track of that and man how God brings those kids and the opportunity to invest in them is a treasure hey a thank you note from uh, Jim Bev and family appreciating your kindness to them with the recent loss of Jim's sister so I wanted to draw that to your attention I was just handed this flyer um, an opportunity that I want you to be aware of. Uh, it, it's titled Reaching Rural Veterans. You're invited to a special event for all veterans and their families. Information on veteran services, free giveaways and gift cards. That happens the third Tuesday of each month from 10 a.m. to noon at Carpenter's Table, which is on North 14th Street, which is the street that goes out towards the old trailmobile. And so, Don Thompson, a uh, longtime friend of mine, uh, has a real passion for helping. And uh, God has put that ministry together. Apparently it's uh, a variety of different organizations involved in that, but Don is hosting that. Again, the third Tuesday of each month from 10 to noon, if you are a veteran or part of a family, it'd be an opportunity at least to check it out once and see what they're making available. And if nothing else, just go and give Don a hug and tell her good work, right? Mm -hmm. Got your Bibles, why don't you turn with me to Mark, chapter 12. Last week's text came to an end as we saw Jesus warning the religious authorities of the day that they were in the process of rejecting the one who would become the chief cornerstone. And they wanted to grab a hold of him. They wanted to grab him, but because they were afraid of the people, they didn't do it. And that text, that section came to an end. So they left him and went away. But that wasn't going to last long, as we'll see in today's rather lengthy text. But I'll try to address it efficiently so that we continue as we make our way through Mark. Begin reading this morning in verse 13. So after they had went away, they were coming back, and the text says, Then they sent some of the Pharisees and Herodians to him in order to trap him in the statement. The word trap there is literally one that they would have known as setting a trap for a wild animal to catch it, right? With, with ill, with Ill at, at heart. And they came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are truthful and defer to no one, for you are not partial to any. You teach the way of God in truth. And I, I, what I wouldn't give to see the expression on Jesus' face when they just said that. It's like, yeah, right, fella. And then they ask what will be a series of three questions that they ask him. Is it lawful to pay a poll tax to Caesar or not? Shall we pay or shall we not pay? But he, knowing their hypocrisy, said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. And they brought him one, and he said to them, Whose likeness and inscription is this? And they said to him, Caesar's. And Jesus said to them, Render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. And they were amazed at him. You know, they were looking for a gotcha moment, and instead he turns the table and got them, right? It's not over. Some Sadducees, who say that there is no resurrection, which is why they are sad, you see? <laughs> okay, it's so old fun. and corny, but you won't forget it. Right? There's no resurrection, so no wonder they were sad. So this life was it. This was all you got. And they came to Jesus and began questioning him, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies and leaves behind a wife and leaves no child, his brother should marry the wife and raise up children to his brother. So it was a biblical principle. It was a, they call it leveret marriage. And it was all about maintaining 
family ownership or possession of the promised land that God had given them. And they didn't want any of those, the line to, to be done away with. And so it was family obligation. So from there then, they began to devise the most ridiculous scenario. Again, just looking to get Jesus to stumble over his words so that they might have him. So there were seven brothers. And the first took a wife and died, leaving no children. The second one married her and died, leaving behind no children. And the third likewise. And so all seven left no children. So this time, instead of the old movie, this is one bride and seven brothers instead of seven brides. For seven. You youngsters won't get that. Maybe Netflix has that one, but the rest of us know that one, all right? And then it says, verse 23, in the resurrection, which they don't believe in, interestingly enough, when they rise again, which one's wife will she be? For all seven had married her. And Jesus said to them, is this not the reason you are mistaken, that you do not understand the scriptures or the power of God? For when they rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels in heaven. But regarding the fact that the dead rise again, have you not read in the book of Moses, in the passage about the burning bush, how God spoke to him, saying, I am the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob? He is not the God of the dead, but of the living. You are greatly mistaken, which religious experts did not like to have pointed out in public. <laughs> so two tries, two fails. Next man up. This one appears to me to be a, just a bit different, that maybe his motives are driven by a more genuine search. One of the scribes came and heard them arguing and recognized that he had answered them well, ask him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, teacher, Right, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one and there is no one else besides him. And to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. And so Jesus asked a question. Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple. How is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David? David himself said in the Holy Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? And the large crowd enjoyed listening to him. Let's pray. Father, no doubt you have us here with purpose in mind this morning. It is your intention, Holy Spirit, to instruct us. So we ask you to sow that into our hearts, which will yield, which will produce what you intend. Lord, sometimes it's easy for us to set aside the scriptures as not applicable to us. Nothing there for me. Or maybe just to be fascinated with the interpretation and never get around to the application of what am I going to do with this? So just meet us where we are and draw us to yourself with your glory in mind. In Jesus' name we pray. And amen. You know, not everybody that asks a question really is looking for an answer, you know? Maybe you've even been guilty of that. That you've been in a situation where you ask pointed, difficult questions when 
you really weren't interested in an answer to the question. You just wanted to kind of create a, a, a dust storm. Just kick a mess up into the air so you didn't have to really deal with the matter at hand. Well, that's what these characters are doing. They're looking to catch Jesus in, 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 a, in a word stumble. They want an accusation against him. They want to do away with him. And so they bring their heavy hitters, their experts. Interesting pair, and I'm no great historian on this, but the Pharisees and Herodians really didn't align normally until they had a common enemy in Jesus. The Pharisees were staunchly conservative of adherence to the law. The Herodians supported Roman rule through the line of Herod. Uh, uh, sort of cooperating with the Roman extension of law. They would not have gotten along ordinarily until they had a common adversary who was Jesus. And so here they came and they thought they had him the purpose Perfect question. We'll get him with this. Should we pay tax to Caesar or should we not? When you're not sure, just throw a little political matter out into the room and see what happens. We'll get it going. Either way, Jesus goes. It appeared it was a loss, right? If he says, well, of course we should pay tax to Caesar, those highly conservative Pharisees were going to lose their mind. We can't be given anything to that pagan idolater who thinks he is God. And if he said, oh, well, no, of course we shouldn't pay our taxes to Caesar, then he was in trouble with the Roman government, and they liked that too. They didn't care who got rid of him. They just wanted him rid. Right? They thought they had him. <coughs> but listen. <laughs> Jesus sees through all the games, you know? And maybe even from time to time, we can be guilty of holding on to some little shred of a question, some little, some little issue that we've, we've struggled with in the past, and we've, we've held on to something, and, and, and it's never quite been resolved for us, and, and we've used that to kind of uh, not go all in with Jesus. But listen, he, he sees it. He, he knows that's what we're up to, just like he did with these characters. And he said, well, you bring me a coin. And he asked for a specific one that he knew would have the likeness of Caesar on it. And when he got there, who is this? And they said, Caesar. And then the classic response, render to Caesar what is Caesar's and to God what is God's. I want to contend with you that if ever there was a time for Jesus to call for a revolution against a pagan, ungodly government, this was it. Either, either now or later on when he's standing before Pontius Pilate, when, and we've looked at that one time, remember? When Pilate says to Jesus, don't you know I have authority over you? And Jesus said, through his beaten, bloody body, you'd have no authority over me if it hadn't been given you from above. Governing authorities rule at God's bequest. Is that the right word? They're, they're, they're servants of God, according to Paul in Romans 13. With the intention of suppression of evil. Do they all do it well and properly and right? No, Caesar wasn't. Caesar fashioned himself to be God. And here was the opportunity. Jesus could have called his followers, let's run those Romans out of town. But he had bigger fish to fry, so to speak. He had eternal kingdoms he wanted to build. He was not going to stoop to, to, to give himself to the revolt against an earthly one. Because kingdoms are going to come and go. They rise up and they fall. The laws that you make today that may very well be good and valuable and, and highly moral may very well get kicked aside in the next generation or vice versa. It happens all the time. We need to focus on the heart of the matter and speaking and sharing the gospel and living the gospel boldly in the midst of an environment that is increasingly anti-Christ. Don't worry about the earthly government we are, we are citizens of an eternal one. Let that be where we put our efforts and our energies. Jesus said, get to Caesar what is Caesar's. What is it that our New Testament teaches us we owe Caesar? Well, believe it or not, Romans 13 says we owe him our taxes. 
Because they work for him. That's what it says. They work for him, and so we pay our taxes. Oh, and he says, honor the king. Yeah, we're, we're probably dropping the ball on that one a little lately. It's been a little tough to honor the king, huh? If we, he says, pray for those in authority. Pray for them. I, I wonder if we pray for them just, just split it 50-50. Just if, you, if we pray for them as much as we complain about them, how it might look different. We should be rendering to Caesar our prayers <clears throat> and our honor because they hold a position of authority that is God-given. We honor them whether they wield it appropriately or not. He'll take care of that. They work for him. Even in the whatever we want to call our, our uh, a democratic republic or whatever we want to call it. You want to say, they work for us. Well, okay, but according to the scripture, they work for God. Honor them and pray for them. That's what the scriptures tell us. We owe Caesar. I'm more than happy at some point to sit in dialogue with you. If you don't like I, I, let, me, I, let me just see your chapter and verse. That's all I want to say. So they're amazed, you know. They, they, they didn't know what to do. And so the Sadducees show up who don't believe in the resurrection. They think this life is it. And what do they pose? What do they think they'll get him to stumble with is a scenario from a situation that they don't even believe is ever going to happen. Who's Whose wife is she going to be after we have followed the law of Moses one, two, three, four, five, six, seven times, and then we get into the eternity? Who, <coughs> who's who's what? You know, where which mansion is she going to inhabit when we all get there, right? And Jesus says, "You guys don't even know what you're talking about," which kind of goes over our heads because we don't necessarily fashion ourselves as experts in anything. Biblically speaking, but they did. That would have been just like, oh, you know. But listen, Jesus gives us just a little hint here. A, a reality about heaven is when, when we get there, this blessing of a, an exclusive husband and wife relationship that has provided for order in society and the procreation of humanity. It's not going to be necessary then like it is now. It won't be giving and receiving in marriage. You'll be like the angels. It's, it will be not necessary. Now, that doesn't mean you're not going to remember who your spouse was. You most, I believe, most certainly will. Remember, and you'll be thankful for all that the faith encounters and experiences as you've gone through this life together. Who would we have gone any closer with than our spouse, at least by God's design? That's how it works. But eternity is just going to look so much different in terms of our experience. And, and Jesus was hinting at that. He said, boy, we're not even going to worry about whose wife she is. It's, 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 that's over. That's complete. Done. And again, they don't know what to do with it. They're, they're failing really bad. The first two have crashed. The scribe. And, and they were just known to be experts in the law. Heard them, recognized that he had answered them well. And so he brings a question. What commandment is the foremost of all? Now for us, maybe for you, you know, well, commandments. Is he talking about the Ten Commandments? Well, they would be part of that. But the Ten are just sort of like a, 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 a thumbnail summary of all that God communicated about who he was and what he expects from his people. Jewish tradition says there are as many as 613 laws in, in the Old Covenant. And this old boy that comes to Jesus asking this question would have known them all inside and out. He would have immersed himself in them. Study, study, study. He would have known them. He says, hey, Jesus, could you just give me the top of the list here? Could you just tell me which one I really need to focus on? Settle that for me, Jesus, would you? 
And Jesus doesn't hesitate. He goes immediately to Deuteronomy chapter 6, which they call the Shema because of the first word there, to hear. Hear. Listen up, Israel. The Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love him with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That was Bible school. Sound effect we used last year. I remembered it. I don't know if the kids did. Love him. One of the old church fathers, Roger, maybe you remember, said, love God and do whatever you will. Do you remember that one? <laughs> love God and do whatever you will. Because if you're loving him, you're not going to cross those 613 lines that he established out there for our good because you want to, you want to please him. So you start by loving God. And if you wonder what it looks like to love God, the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's where it gets tangible. You can talk all about loving God you want to, but it gets visible, it gets real when it's your neighbor. And I know you all got some crazy neighbors. <laughs> of course, the funny thing is, that's what they say about, you know, we're their neighbor. <laughs> And Jesus, they tried to wiggle around this when it, in another context and said, well, who's my neighbor? And Jesus, in essence, he tells the story of the Good Samaritan. He said, well, anybody you encounter who has need, that's your neighbor. You take care of them. You know? Don't just live for yourself. Don't just, you know, you, 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 you look out for them. You take care for them. You do for them what you hope someone would do for you if you were in that position. You know? You don't just go around on the other side of the road like all the religious folks had done to that guy. You want to know, you want a litmus test for how you're doing loving God? How are you loving your neighbor? Take, take a look at your relationships with people around you, and that'll tell you how you're doing on the vertical. That's, that's the old litmus test. Love God, love people. And, and all 613 will fall into that neat, orderly little summary. Man, that scribe, you know, what would have gone through his mind? You kidding me? I've memorized 613 and Jesus says all I needed was two. <laughs> and he was duly impressed. And here's why, as I said to you earlier, I think it might have been a legitimate inquiry from this man. He said in verse 32, right, teacher, you have truly stated that there is one, there is no one else besides him and to love him with all your heart understanding strength and, and one the neighbor as himself and then this is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices now that would have been a scandalous statement to Jewish people living under the old covenant because their approach to God was entirely based you know on taking care of the, the, the offerings and the sacrifices. And for this man, who was an expert in the law, said, you know what? We could do all the offerings and the sacrifices and not love people and love God. It's about driving into the heart of matter, isn't it? Not just external conformity. We keep all 600... 19 or 613 letters of the law and missed the spirit of it. That's what Jesus did. He, he knew the letter of the law. I mean, in essence, he wrote them, right? But he knew that it was loving God and loving neighbor that were the spirit of all 613. Jesus was impressed with that response. You're not far from the kingdom of God. You got it, man. Come on in. <laughs> in essence, that's what he was saying. After that, nobody would ask him any questions. And then this, Jesus turns the tables and asks them a question. Quoting the scribes, 
How is it that the scribes say that Christ is the son of David when David himself said, in the Holy Spirit, so it's inspired by the Spirit, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. How is it that the Messiah, the Christ, could be both the son of David and be seated as deity at the right hand of the Father until the Father finishes things up and launches eternity? In what sense is he his son? David calls him Lord. A title of, of respect a huge honor. Some commentators suggested that it may very well be after Jesus has just come through this battery of questions as they were trying to get him to stumble that he provides them one more opportunity at a veiled glimpse into who he really is. The God-man. Son of David? Absolutely. Through his mother Mary, fully man, and yet Son of God, currently seated at the right hand of the Father until the Father finally says, okay, it's all done. Let's wrap this up. Do you know who it is that you're dealing with? When you come to Jesus, have you acknowledged his place in your life? Or you're still trying to mess around and play games by saying, yeah, but what about this? Or what about this? Or I want you to get to a place where the message of this song is your anthem. It's a Lauren Daigle song. Or she's doing it. It's not her song. In Christ alone, I'll take my stand. <clears throat> and I'll come back and close. <clears throat> it's pretty simple. <clears throat> Till he returns or calls me home, either he's coming or I'm going. That's pretty basic. <clears throat> Till he returns or calls me home, here in the power of Christ, I'll stand. I want you standing in that power, in the security of that relationship that you've established by rejecting your own self-righteousness, any attempt to be good enough to get to God because of what you've done or haven't done, and you have entrusted your eternal destiny to Christ and Christ alone so that when he returns or calls me home, you're all ready. You got it. If you've not settled that issue yet, there's nothing more pressing than that. I would delight to have that conversation with you if you'd like to take that discussion further. Let's get that settled. It is a matter of eternity. All right? There's a world out there that awaits, knowing it or not, <coughs> needs Jesus. It's our privilege to represent him. Let's go be the church. <coughs> yes,